I'm in a very unique position in that I got to listen to all these wonderful talks for the past two days, and I'm coming very close to the end, if not at the end. Um, like Annalise, who spoke before, I'm not presenting some research in laboratory, veterinary, or agricultural facilities, but instead I'm going to be talking about some animal welfare in terms of the human-animal bond. Um, I was able to notice in everyone's talks that most everyone is doing a lot of enrichment and animal welfare, and that was wonderful to see because that's been a major change over the past 15 years. So we've made a lot of progress. This, so this will be more of just kind of a reminder of things that we can do. Um, so the human-animal bond, of course, is talking about the relationship between a person and an animal. And we used to just think that this was always between domestic animals and humans, mainly companion animals, I should say, and pets. But our understanding has broadened over the past 20 years or so, and we now think of it in terms of agricultural relationship bonds, um, laboratory relationship bonds, and even temporary bonds in veterinary facilities. So the definition is the relationship between a person and a single animal. Russo, 2002, suggested that it's reciprocal and persistent and that it enhances the well-being for both parties. However, it's not an all or none thing. There are gradations and there are different types of relationships that people develop with the animals that they work with or live with. Catherine Bain, in also in 2002, pointed out that it can be one-sided. You can have a person who gets attached to an animal and the animal couldn't care you less. And I'll give you a couple examples of that in a little bit. Or you can have an animal that feels bonded to a worker and the worker is completely unresponsive. There have been studies showing that laboratory animals will bond with their usual caretaker. And when that caretaker goes on vacation, they actually show behavioral signs of depression and don't respond as well to the substitute caretaker. Uh, these bonds can form for different reasons. The caretaker may identify with the animal that they're caring for. The researcher may identify or care about the animal they're researching. The veterinarian may bond with an animal that they see on a routine basis for treatment. Animals also can become dependent on us when we develop a nurturing relationship with them. So it's important to think about these bonding relationships because they actually affect research treatment and food production. There's a lot of evidence, uh, published research showing that Increasing the predictability between the human and the animal reduces the development of immunodeficiencies in the animals. It reduces the levels and effects of chronic stress hormones like cortisol, which can affect the way food um, meets taste. It can affect how effective treatments are, and it can absolutely affect research results. It improves consistency in results, having a, a positive bond and it can make handling time and staff efficiency better because the animals are more likely to cooperate with individuals that they trust and feel safe around. There are many more studies, there are many more reasons to pay attention to the human-animal bond. So uh, with um, Estep and Hetz, there are, they talk about five types of bonds we can develop. With a predator relationship, the animal is afraid of you. They think you're going to eat them. So they avoid you, they run to the back of the cage, or they don't cooperate. And the vets, um, the cattle are fearful and uncooperative when they need to be examined. If it's a prey relationship, the animal wants to eat you. And you will be at risk for damaging behaviors. If it's socially insignificant, basically you have a neutral 
almost non-existent relationship and the animal habituates to your presence and ignores you and there's not really any usefulness to the relationship. Sometimes the animal will see you as a conspecific. You may bond with the animal or it may see you as a rival. There may be some dominance and submission relationships going on. I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. Um, and do they really think you're a member of their species? We don't know. I tend to doubt it, but yet they will react to you as if you were a member of their species. And then a symbiont relationship is where there is mutual communication, but there's no emotional relationship, if I can use that anthropomorphic term. So here are some personal examples from different environments I've worked in. I've worked in animal shelters. I've worked in research laboratories. I have been a behavioral consultant for pets. I've consulted with veterinary offices and things like that. So here are a few examples. I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship and we were testing the auditory same different concept in rhesus macaques. And FD was his name and I were working together and I felt we had a mutually non-existent relationship. He didn't respond to me. He sometimes threatened me. But one day after several months of working together, there was a play session and we had a nice game of bat hands where he stuck his hand out and we were batting our hands back and forth in play. He suddenly grabbed the bars and shook them and did what I thought was a threat. And I jumped back and went, oh, because I didn't know any better and I was scared. It turned out it was a play threat. He pulled my hand into his cage and started patting it very gently and making appeasement faces. So we actually had a relationship developing. And then when I misinterpreted his behavior, his signals, he calmed me down and showed me that I had misunderstood. BW was another rhesus macaque on this same project. And he was a little guy. He was only about two years old. And normally when I came in, I had very long, very straight hair. And one day I got a hair permanent. I got my hair curled and I came in looking like this. And poor BW just thought I was pilo erecting and threatening him. And he leaped back to the back of his cage and made this fear grimace. And I grabbed my hair with both hands and pulled it flat and said, BW, it's me, it's okay and he immediately calmed down. So he was interpreting my social signals with my hair as if I was another rhesus macaque. I did get to work and live at Lou Herman's Koala Basin Marine Mammal Lab for my graduate work for my PhD. We were studying artificial language comprehension skills, and I lived at the back of the lab and we had a kitchen at the front of the lab. It was an outdoor lab. I had a little shack in the back and Phoenix was riding the rails. She was using it as what we call here a slip and slide. She was playing on the rails and sliding along. And I was sitting out again. I was sitting at the front of the lab at the breakfast table and I heard this weird sound And I realized it was a distress, distress call and I went running back and she had slipped out. She had actually been riding the outside rails, not this center wall. And she'd fallen out of the tank. So we rushed and found some big strong men and we, I got in the tank and our director got in the tank and they put her back in. And she was a little scraped up. She wasn't hurt, but she was a little scraped up. And my director kept saying, don't touch her, don't touch her. Well, she put herself in my arms. She literally swam into me and snuggled up against my chest, as you can see in this photo. And as I was holding her, I could feel her heartbeat very rapidly and then start to begin to slow down. So I was comforting her. I was holding her. Yes, that's anthropomorphic, but I don't know what else to call it. And when she was calm, she swam out of my arms and turned out and threatened to bite me, which was her statement of saying, okay, I'm good, get out. 
veterinary example. Windsor was a nine, eight-year-old neutered black male who just was hyper. He was extremely hyperactive. He was constantly mouthing, jumping, grabbing toys out of your hands and accidentally biting your hands. He was a very nice dog, but he was just out of control. And we tried everything with him. He was really hard to examine. He just would bounce and try to play and try to escape and run around and jump up and down. And he never calmed down. We could exercise him for an hour, throwing to toys or balls for an hour, and he just never calmed down. So what we ended up doing was putting him in a quiet room for about 20 minutes before he needed some kind of an exam. We put in tons of toys because he loved toys and we just didn't touch them. We just sat on the floor. We didn't, excuse me, we didn't touch any toys that he brought to us. We just ignored him. And after around 20 minutes, he calmed down and started to lie on the floor and would let us rub his stomach. And what he learned was being quiet around people was a good thing. You got a lot of positive reinforcement. And so we were able to wean him into being quiet for veterinary exams. And this was building a relationship of calmness and trust between human and animal. Another example of an unexpected connection. Ferdinand, this was at a zoo. Uh, I was on sabbatical. Ferdinand was an eight-year-old, eight another eight-year-old, male intact llama at the zoo. He had been bottle raised as a Kriya, so he was imprinted on humans. And he was nasty. He wouldn't let you lead him. He refused room or hoof, hoof care or other husbandry. He would spit. He would head bite. He head butt. He would bite. He would kick. He just wasn't a nice guy. And I was working with another behaviorist. We were trying to use operant conditioning and all kinds of techniques to get him to accept grooming. His fur was really matted. We were concerned about developing skin infections. So we were working on him to lead and to groom. And he was nasty to me all the time. I just thought he hated me. Any relationship we had was extremely negative. Well, unfortunately, one night, a bunch of neighborhood dogs snuck under the fence at the zoo and got to Ferdy's mate and killed her. It was really quite horrific. They were kept in two separate paddocks, and you could see where he had tried to break out of his paddock to go to her aid and was a unable to. So they we found her in the morning. I was up at the research facility and the senior caretaker called me and said, you need to come down and comfort Ferdy. And I said, you're crazy. He hates me. He, he tries to bite me. He spits on me. He headbutts me. She said, trust me, just come down. Well, I was wrong. He actually saw me as a conspecific. And when I came into his pen, he came running over to me and started wrapping his long neck around my chest to be held, which are llama hugs. And he stood there and trembled and leaned against me. So we had a relationship that I didn't understand, similar with FD, where he was trying to dominate me and I wasn't being submissive enough when we were working together. But when it came to herd relationships, he saw me as someone he could go to to comfort. So where are we? Everybody knows the three R's and the five freedoms. Almost all of us do this with laboratory animals and some farms are able to do it with their agricultural animals. Animals do learn names. Even laboratory animals learn names. And research shows that if a laboratory technician or a farmer names their animal, they receive better care. When the animals become individuals to us instead of just um, products, they do better and it's better for our research. Environmental, behavioral, and social enrichment, whether it's at a farm or it's at a laboratory or even in a veterinary office where people are seeing patients, providing these 
elements improves the success of treatment, improves production and quality of the meat being produced, and makes research outcomes much more stable. And there's a lot of research published that is showing this. So it's important that we provide the best welfare, even for animals that are in short-term terminal studies. Um, I Again, I was very impressed with how much the field has developed over the past 15, 20 years based on all the photos that people were showing us in this wonderful conference. So when you are working with your animals, whether in the laboratory, in an agricultural setting, or in a veterinary situation, decide which bonding relationship you have and what you want to have and what's going to be the best for your final outcomes. What you pick is going to affect your research, your treatments for patients, and the food quality outcome. And it affects animal welfare, not only for our animals, but also for ourselves. So whether or not you consciously pick one, there is a relationship. You might as well think about what relationship is going to work best for your situation. Here's a bunch of sample research articles. And thank you, I got to work at zoos, and these were some of the elephants I got to work with. I'm happy to take any questions.